evening, everyone, and welcome to another installment of TED Excellence, the show in which we find out how science and science will save us from science or something. And I come to you live from Crater Valley on the moon with Dog Cat Fox, a Pepper Jack, and all of you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome again to Thursday. Uh, trying Thursday. More like month-end Thursday, so it was a bunch of paperwork and spreadsheets with work and stuff, which is always fun. And by fun, I mean tedious and mind-numbing. But hey, what are you going to do? Say la vie. Uh, hope you're all doing well this evening. Before I get into tonight's subject, who's joining me on this adventure into science? Science. Uh, Noah Asensio, hello. Jimmy Jam, hello. Jaeger Pony, hello. Grand Inquisitor Tier Alexander, hello. Kiever Dam, hello. Miranda Stone, hello. Shell D, hello. Simon Willikins, hello. Tony Giff, hello. Resolute Germ, hello. John Miller, hello. Advocatus Diaboli, hello. Mm, let's see. Chicago Mike, hello. Derek LaRue, hello. And thank you, Derek, as always, for your continued support and generosity. Hope you're having a good Thursday and that you enjoy the show. Attack Alpaca, hello. Brittany Holland, hello. Bearded Devil, 1864. It was a very good year, I think. I don't I don't know what happened in 1864. Is that like uh, nigh on the end of uh, the Civil War? Or is that 1865? I'm an English major, not a history major. That'll come into play shortly as well. Uh, Dixie Rose, 63. Hello. The one-ton hammer. Although he's dropped that one ton. Good on you for that weight loss. Hammer, how you doing? And Keeverdam, thank you so much for posting at the top of the chat box, guys, the fundraisers tonight uh, for our friends Joshua, Maddie, and Lisa. Uh, Joshua needs some help with some uh, financial uh, pitfalls that have befallen him, if you take a look at that. Uh, Maddie is in need of some help with some cancer treatment deductibles uh, because of, well, cancer treatment. And Lisa and her boyfriend are trying to pay for the medical bills of their doggo. So you guys take a look at that. Uh, if you can donate, thank you so much. If you can't donate, that's fine. But if you can share those out on social media, that would be appreciated. Uh, Ercole Di Stefano, hello. Tall person, hello. And I think that's everybody I see. Uh, if I've uh, missed you, if you're lurking, if you're in the future, hello. All right. So tonight, in my uh, eternal quest to find subjects on TEDx that occasionally make me go, what? We have before us today, CRISPR for climate. Now, as previously stated, I am an English major. I am not a science major. I'm not a chemistry major. I'm not a biological science major. Uh, so my understanding of CRISPR is rudimentary at best. But I think I am safe in saying that CRISPR is a process, something by which you edit genes, genetic editing, Okay, so now I'm going into this with that understanding. If I'm corrected by our speaker, by all means. But the uh, whole point of that is when I saw the title, I thought to myself, CRISPR for climate, genetic engineering for, I assume, the improvement of, of the climate. Okay, well, what causes climate change, as I've been told? Well, the burning of fossil fuels. All right. That's the primary driver of climate change. All right. So uh, burning of fossil fuels is a human endeavor in one form or another. All right. So if you're going to be editing genes, I thought, okay, well, uh, what would you edit in humans? If it was humans, what would you edit to improve the climate? I, I don't know. If it was in animals, what would you do to improve the climate? Could you genetically engineer cows to fart less? I don't know. If it was plants, what could you do? Could you genetically engineer plants to absorb more carbon dioxide from the air or carbon monoxide, whichever it is? You know, the one that, that's bad or, or, or worse. I don't know. I, I, you know. These are the questions that came to me and I have no idea. So how does genetic editing affect the climate? That's what the question is today. That's what we'll hopefully find out from our speaker in this talk that runs uh, just under 15 minutes. So I better get started here. Uh, the bingo card tonight is bingo card A. A as in um, uh, amniocentesis. I, I tried to come up with an A word that was science-y. That's, that's the best I could do 
at a glance. So there you go. Card A, links are in the description. Take a look at that. Uh, let's see. Angel vs. Hello, Skid Caesar. <laughs> Skid Caesar. Sid C- I know I know who Sid Caesar was. I, I used to watch those old reruns of things. I get that reference a little bit. Anyway, how about Caesar Romero? I like Cesar Romero. Anyway. All right. So let's get into it, guys. Uh, let's see again, under just, just under 15 minutes. I'll start off with a few seconds for a sound test. You let me know if you can hear it, and then we will proceed. Let me start with an unfortunate fact. Okay. Agriculture is bad for the climate. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a that is an opening salvo. So there you go. Uh, agriculture is bad for the climate. Okay. Everybody get that? Uh, I gotta get my bingo card going. There we go. Bingo card. They've done some like weird updates to uh, Microsoft Paint recently, and like the controls are different, and it doesn't operate the same. And so I have to like reconfigure everything every time. Anyway, sorry about that. Uh, robot. Oh, I'm roboting. Uh oh. Uh oh. Am I still roboting? What, was it me adjusting paint that caused roboting? Why, why is this so tenuous? In this day and age, in 2023, with the amount of money I pay for internet speed and quality, why is it that if I just open up a paint program, suddenly my sound goes all kablooey? Okay. Have I have I killed enough time now that it's uh, it's it's fixed itself? All right. Oh boy. All right. Well, now anyway, uh, agriculture is bad for the climate. I guess. Let me say that again. Okay. The way we grow and produce food is one of the major reasons why our planet is in the climate crisis it is today. Okay. I'll, I'll that that is your premise, and so we're going to edit the genes of plants rice cows fertilizer deforestation taken together nearly one third of all greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture oh, okay yeah if you chop down trees in order to make room for raising cattle and okay all right i'll uh, i will I, I will i will take your premise let's run with it at the same time Climate change is also really bad for agriculture. Uh, okay. It's already causing dramatic oscillations in weather patterns. More floods, more droughts, more pandemics, and not just pandemics for people, but pandemics for plants that could ultimately cause widespread famine. Well, it's a pretty, uh, pretty bleak prospect. Um, wh- whose genes are we editing? Both of these problems, ag emissions and crop loss due to climate, Mm -hmm. are just going to get worse as climate change intensifies and the world adds close to 2 billion more people in the next 25 years. Okay. And? How are we going to feed 10 billion people without destroying our planet? Soylent green. Soylent green? Soylent green. What if we could farm without any net greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, Farm without net greenhouse... Okay, what if? What if Dr. Doom was the Sorcerer Supreme? I don't know. Truly a net zero farm. There would be... Okay, there's no such thing as net zero in anything when it comes to... No. Okay, no. A world where we could grow all the food that we need, even Uh in the face of a changing climate. Okay. And be part of the global climate solution. Okay. What is that? I'm here today to talk to you about CRISPR and how it can Mm -hmm. help do exactly that. Excellent. CRISPR is the genome editing tool that scientists use to cut and paste DNA, just like you would edit a sentence in a document. (laughs) Well, if I know anything about editing sentences and documents... I wouldn't trust me with editing DNA, but anyway. It's, uh, in short, it allows you to change the function of living cells. Mm -hmm. I became the executive director of the Innovative Genomics Institute, the IGI, in 2020. The IGI, the Innovative Genomics Institute. 
Sounds like a company in like some uh, Jurassic Park novel or some kind of like science fiction book where that's where everything goes awry in the lab somewhere. The same year that our founder, Jennifer Doudna, won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for her pioneering work in CRISPR. That's right. Let's go, Jennifer. Woo, Jennifer. I was drawn to the IGI as a place where CRISPR could be applied to help improve the lives of nearly every person in the world, to help create a sustainable future. I uh, see. When you use the word sustainable, it, it sends up red flags because sustainable is closely associated with arguments for ESG. And that's where I, and I, I mean, it is a word in and of itself that's not necessarily connected to that idea, but, you know, inherently, but all the same, it gives me, it gives me a bit of a twitch, a little bit of a twitch. I think of John Miller. I bet this moron has no clue that plants produce oxygen like CO2. I, I don't know. I, I guess we'll find out because, you know, both raising crops causes climate problems and then climate problems also destroy crops so it's a vicious cycle vicious circle uh ron harushin someday i'll say it correctly good evening anybody else i missed while i'm looking at this right now uh, i think i got everybody all right okay and but before i tell you about CRISPR for climate let me too, uh, tell you a little bit about myself and okay. how i came to be here okay well I hope we get something on the board soon. I, I mean, it, it would be something if we had a whole TEDx without any square circle. It's happened once before, the opposite of a blackout. My last job was to be the director of the biotech office at a place called DARPA. DARPA is the Department of Defense's high-risk, high-reward high research funding agency, and it's considered one of the premier science and technology innovation hubs in the world. So you went from DARPA to editing genes. I don't know that that's necessarily a, uh, a comforting notion. <laughs> the internet, GPS, self-driving cars, you guessed it, all had their origins at DARPA. The internet had its origins at DARPA. Well, like networking computers, I, I, I guess that's true. Isn't that true? I guess that's true, probably true. <clears throat> I had a uh, program manager that used to say at DARPA, if you don't invent the internet, you get a B. <laughs> <laughs> and he was kind of right because DARPA is showing that technology can truly transform the world. Uh, wow, DARPA's shown that technology can transform the world. Don't tell that to that guy that invented the wheel or anything <laughs> or, or discovered fire. But what about biotechnology? I don't know. Can the same be said about its potential to change the world? Uh, golly, uh, I don't know. Uh, vaccines. Vaccines. Maybe. Okay. Well, my office had a pretty good track record there, too. We were early investors in vaccines based hey! on messenger RNA. Hey, you know what? Yeah, and you know what? Here's the thing. Uh, messenger RNA. Oh, God. Uh, how about just like old school vaccines, just like, you know, putting a dead version of a virus in a person to let their immune system react to it. And messenger RNA, are those really vaccines? Isn't that gene therapy? I don't know if that's an argument I want to get into right now. YouTube doesn't like it if you start discussing messenger RNA vaccines. Uh, let's go to the bingo card real quick because Derek LaRue in the chat makes a good point. He is making a sales pitch for a product or service, and CRISPR, DARPA, et cetera, are products and or services. So let's go over the bingo card one time to remind ourselves what we're listening for elsewise. Collectivizes own demographic, systemic or institutional, childhood or family anecdote, diversity, equity, and or inclusion, plays victim, microaggressions or unconscious bias, privilege, contradicts own point or argument, patriarchy, Weightless example, wage gap or income inequality. I really should just change that at some point. I keep meaning to, but I keep forgetting. Feminism, marginalized or marginalization, a list, and that has to be a formal list. And in this kind of presentation, I'd be surprised if we don't get one. Uh, white supremacy, 
word salad, self-vilification or wretchedness, argumentative non sequitur, attempt to coin new buzzword or buzz phrase, mind reading or assumes motives, benevolent condescension, anecdote that probably never happened, and lastly, leaves out vital context. So, so far on the board, we have sales pitch for product or service, and consequently from that, free space because free is a good price. All right, let's keep going. We discovered some of the first monoclonal antibodies to be used to treat COVID. Mm. Thanks a lot. And we developed neural implants that allowed a quadriplegic to fist bump President Obama just by thinking about moving his own arm. Okay, you know, cybernetics kind of technology for uh, prosthetics and things like that, that stuff's pretty cool. I'm not, I'm not going to deny it. You know, it's, it's a bit sci-fi, obviously, and everything, but I, I think that stuff's pretty neat. So everything else aside, yeah, if you can give people functional robot arms and things, I have a hard time arguing with that one. I know. Mm. Or an amputee that had a prosthetic that had sensors in the hands so that when he lifted his daughter, he could actually feel her embrace. Again, that kind of stuff's pretty cool. That kind of stuff's pretty cool. Uh, that's not genetic editing for climate, though, so... That one gets me. Oh, okay. all right, all right, fine. Get over it. So clearly, biotech can change the lives of people as well. Thanks for that. I, I'm also I'm about to circle benevolent condescension. But after 20 years of working for the Department of Defense, it was clear to me that climate change just wasn't squarely in their mission space. So about two and a half years ago, I picked up, moved from Washington, D.C., and came out here to Berkeley and joined forces with Jennifer Doudna to try to change humanity's climate trajectory using CRISPR. Okay, and this is what I'm waiting to hear. How? It's a technology that was discovered just a little over 10 years ago. Uh -huh. but has already spurred a biotech revolution. Uh -huh. CRISPR is a system that combines a precise targeting molecule called guide RNA uh -huh. with a, a molecular scissor called Cas9. And when yes. they're taken together, it allows CRISPR to be able to zero in on a specific DNA sequence and mm. cut it to inactivate a gene or to paste in a DNA sequence to do things like uh, correct a disease-causing mutation or even uh, change the trait of human cells, plant cells, and even bacterial cells. Okay, and the possibilities of CRISPR, as I understand it, could be very, very beneficial in finding cures for things or uh, addressing, you know, uh, genetic abnormalities in people or cancers or, you know, who knows what. And even though AI right now is a decidedly, you know, legitimate boogeyman in some cases. Uh, they've used AI to document and process through data regarding uh, medical situations and genes and everything in ways that would have taken hundreds of some odd years to do manually in just uh, a couple of years or something. So uh, combine that and CRISPR and everything else, I'm hoping I mean, I honestly am hoping for some kind of real revolutionary breakthrough in cancer treatment, in Alzheimer's, uh, in uh, AIDS research, anything you can think of. You know, it'd be great. We haven't seen, like, something that dramatic yet, as far as I know, but I'm hoping. So, yes, there are definitely, conceivably, a lot of benefits to uh, genetic therapy or CRISPR editing. When do we get to the climate part? And why, if you want to get out of defense and your biggest concern is the climate, why would your first instinct be to go to genetic editing? How, do, how does that connect? CRISPR has raced out of the lab to make a real-world impact. There are human clinical trials going on to develop treatments for things like cancer, yes. previously incurable diseases like sickle cell, yeah. and even blindness. Great. I am glad. That is all good. We're now five minutes into a 15-minute presentation, and I haven't heard anything yet about how editing genes is going to improve climate change. Although it's still relatively early for many of these treatments, it's clear there's more and more da uh, data suggesting that CRISPR can be used safely and effectively. And many, many... Oh, no, no. <laughs> All right, well, you've already put up another red flag. Safe and effective. Oh, boy. I tell you what. After three years of pandemic, those two words put on something medical involved, I, I 
now you've got me concerned. Agree, because there are billions of dollars being put into startups trying to develop these cures. Great. But what really excites me uh -huh. is the fact that CRISPR is not just limited to new medicines. Uh -huh. DNA is in all living organisms. It's the code of life. So why not unlock CRISPR to help fight other problems facing society? <sighs> okay, again, I'm waiting. At the IGI, we have a team of renowned scientists trying to do just that, to use CRISPR in many different ways to help pause or even reverse climate change. And how? Our plan is to enable a net zero farm, and it breaks it down into three areas of impact. The first, we're going to use CRISPR to help produce crops that are resilient to, to uh, uh, climate disasters. Well, okay, wait. You still, okay, pr to produce crops, okay, well, you need land, arable land in which to make the crops. You need to clear that land to do so. You need to fertilize that land. You need machinery in order to till the land and plant the crops and on and on and on. And wasn't, weren't you saying that agriculture is a contributor to climate change? So... Okay, plants that will survive disasters, more resilient plants. Okay, how? Helping to improve food security. We're also going to use CRISPR to help eliminate agricultural emissions like methane, nitrous oxide from things like rice cultivation and burping cows and fertilizer use. Wait, how? How are you going to use CRISPR to eliminate the need for fertilizer? How are you going to use CRISPR to eliminate burping cows? Okay, well, flatulence of any particular kind. Like, are, are you going to edit farts out of cows? Are you going to remove the need for fertilizer from plants? And at the same time, we're also going to develop uh, and use CRISPR to help enhance plants and microbes' natural ability to absorb carbon from the atmosphere. Yeah, well, what happens when those plants inevitably die or are processed or eaten or whatever? Well, the carbon gets re-released back into the atmosphere. I mean, plants don't absorb carbon and then destroy it. They just bank it. And then it goes back into the atmosphere. It's that... Okay. Okay. We're going to essentially create biotechnologies that can help remove gigatons of atmospheric carbon and put it back in agricultural soils. And then it gets re-released back into the environment. If, if I'm wrong about that, if I'm completely off base, this is my, again, English major basic science understanding of things. Okay. Okay. The work to improve food security is already underway. Our scientists at the IGI can already edit over 30 different crops. Uh -huh. Rice, wheat, but, uh, <laughs> broccoli. Rice, wheat, bro 30 different crops, and you stumble over coming up with a third one? Sunflowers, tomatoes. We're even trying to uh, develop crops that can uh, persist against emerging pathogens by knocking out disease susceptibility genes or create drought-tolerant crops by reducing the number of pores that are, that are on the, the water-losing pores on their leaves. All right, how much is a uh, sustainable tomato going to cost me versus a regular tomato? At the store. H how, much, how much is this uh, crispered wheat going to cost me downstream as a consumer as opposed to classic wheat? We're even trying to save the banana and chocolate from emerging pathogens. Okay, well, on the chocolate point, I can't argue with you. Please save the chocolate. But now, these approaches are going to help us uh, have higher yields and reduce crop losses and be able to allow farmers uh, to grow more on less land. But to really help create a net zero farm, we're going to have to reduce agricultural emissions. And surprisingly, those emissions, the most of them don't come from things like tractor use and burning fuels. They actually come from something called the microbiome. 
okay. And CRISPR is going to solve that. How? It's a community of tiny little microorganisms that mm -hmm. grow all over the planet, but importantly for agriculture, they grow in the gut of cows and in soils. And they release some of the most potent greenhouse gases in the world. Okay, so rather than industry and carbon emissions through the burning of fossil fuels, you want to reduce cow farts. Okay, I mean, that's... That's one way to do it, I guess. Uh, thank you, Roan Harushin. Colonel, the DARPA chief has gone insane and is talking about genetic plants and Metal Gear. This is Big Boss. Okay, my my, my personal knowledge of Metal Gear lore is very limited. I, I played the first game on NES back in the day. Outside of that, I don't know. I do have the novelization of Metal Gear. The tiny little Nintendo Power series of novels that they put out. I, I've got my Metal Gear copy somewhere. I had uh, Ninja Gaiden or Gaiden, however you say it. We always said Gaiden. Uh, and, in, you know, the, the cover, the cover of the original Metal Gear. Well, on the cover of the book version, the novel version, they edited out the gun in the guy's hands because we don't actually want to, like, promote gun use. And this is back in, like, the 80s or the early 90s or whatever. And uh, even in the book, he never actually shoots anybody. He ends up punching them or hitting them with the gun or something. So, uh, also that image of the guy on Metal Gear was stolen from Michael Bean from uh, Aliens. I, I don't know if he ever got uh, compensated for that or not, or if he was allowed that to be licensed. Those are all these little bits I know about Metal Gear. That's about it. Uh, roasted opinions. Those microbes also permit cows and other ruminants to digest cellulose, a critical part of them surviving on grass. Yeah, all of this sounds too good to be true a little bit. You know, when everybody, anybody tells me that they have a panacea for a problem, I like, eh, I'll panacea it when I believe it. The worst of these emitters are livestock. It was res responsible for almost 15% of all global greenhouse gas emissions just from cows and livestock. Okay. So you're going to edit the genes of the microbes that end up in the stomachs of cows, and this will reduce cow farts. <clears throat> Most of that is from a gas called methane, mm -hmm. which has resulted in about 30% of global temperature rises since pre-industrial times. And uh -huh. that methane is emitted from microbes that are in the gut of the cow. All right, so you're going to commit genocide on all of those microbes and replace them with your custom microbes? So our collaborators at UC Davis have already developed a feed supplement that alters that microbiome and uh -huh. reduces the methane, methane output from cows by up to 80%. So, but it's not all the complete solution because it's pretty expensive uh -huh. and it also is difficult to distribute around the world. So we're <laughs> developing a CRISPR solution that oh. could be given to nearly every cow when it's born to alter its microbiome and set that animal on a lifetime course of reduced emissions. Uh, okay, so you're fundamentally going to change how cows operate to reduce their farts. Uh, okay, and you're going to distribute this to every cow on the planet? You know, I have a, I have a feeling, and I could be wrong, someone can correct me on this, I have a feeling there's at least one very populous nation on this planet that may have a problem with science mucking around with the natural development of cows. I could be wrong. Maybe I'm just leaning on a stereotype, but... Rice is also part of the problem. It's 10% mm -hmm. of all agricultural emissions. Mm. The community of microbes that live on and around the roots of rice are great because they support the growth of the rice, but they're really bad because they also produce methane. Uh -huh. So IGI scientists are actually doing the most complete study that's ever been performed to study the rice plant and how the microbes grow and, and uh, produce methane around those plants. Uh -huh. <clears throat> the goal of that work will be able to provide a roadmap of genes and plants and microbes so we can go in and use CRISPR to help turn off those emissions. On rice, one of the most plentiful food sources in many areas of this world you're going to 
in, in, in a way that will be significant enough to make an effect, re-engineer rice. Okay. And uh, in those countries that produce rice the most, they're going to be totally open arms to an American uh, scientific concern coming in and messing around with their food sources. Is that it? I mean, not to be not to be a Debbie Downer here, but I'm just saying it's like uh, maybe you're right, but the likelihood of actually succeeding in any of this to a degree that will be significant enough to affect climate change, I think, is a distant prospect. Uh, thank you, John Miller. So nature is the problem with global warming. Uh, apparently so. Who knew? Who knew? Uh, I, I, I've been told the longest time it was people. You know, and fossil fuels being burnt out of smokestacks for decades upon decades. And especially in those countries that are still developing and have absolutely no reason to turn off their industrial progress for the sake of the environmental concerns of a smaller portion of the planet. There's a great uh, lecture. Uh, oh, God, what was his name? He's like a Russian comedian who's in Britain, and I've suddenly... Constantine something? Anyway, he gave a lecture or a speech, I suppose, at, I think, Oxford uh, last year or several months ago, where he was uh, criticizing environmental activists in Britain and the UK and sort of pushing back against their notion of what how they could affect climate change. And he gave a great breakdown of how it's not, it's not what you think it is, and there's no turning it off. But... Okay, uh, gene editing for less methane. And then finally, fertilizer use results in 20% of agricultural emissions, mm -hmm. this time from a gas called nitrous oxide. Mm -hmm. But again, guess where it comes from? Uh, speed racers. Oh, no, sorry. No, nitrous oxide is used by speed racers. I, I, chicken and egg, sorry. The soil microbes, okay? Mm -hmm. When you use fertilizer, those microbes release nitrous oxide. Okay. IGI scientists are working uh, to try to edit crops and microbes so they work together to use nitrogen more efficiently. Try to. They are trying to. Can they? Reducing emissions, but also cutting costs for farmers who won't have to buy as much fertilizer as well. Uh huh. This brings me to my uh, plan to help remove atmospheric carbon. Remove it. Okay, this is the part where you're going to say, oh, we're going to make trees and plants that absorb more of it. And when they finally die and decay, where does that go again? And return it to ag soils. And we think it's a perfect place to put carbon because those soils have already lost close to 500 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalents since humans have started farming. Gigaton. Gigaton. That's over 10 times the number of human emissions every year. Mm. What if we could use CRISPR to help put this carbon back? It would help achieve global climate goals, but it would also let farmers help work in marginal and underutilized lands. Marginal? Well, that's at least a little part of marginalized marginalization, so I'm going to circle that one just because... This, uh, this talk seems pretty sparse on the squares tonight. Uh, also, I'm going to circle a list. I should have done earlier because he did have a list of uh, goals and potential benefits from CRISPR to the climate. So circle in that one. And convert those into more fertile soils, helping to reduce the need for deforestation. It's a win-win-win. Very few things in life are win-win-wins. I know, I know. I'm being a doubting Thomas. I'm being a Debbie Downer. <sighs> what about what about the real problem here? You know, that I hear about all the time. The burning of fossil fuels. I mean, agricultural emissions. I'm sure he said it. I've already forgotten it. How much of a percentage of yearly, uh, you know, emissions that affect the climate do agricultural activities amount to up against the burning of fossil fuels is just another example, right? And, and rice and cows have been producing methane since time began. And yet climate change, as I've understood it, has only really started in the last couple hundred years. So do you really think that affecting rice and cows and fertilizer is going to make any kind of significant dent 
And do you think, and I'm, I know I'm asking rhetorically, do, do you really think that you could implement these changes on a wide enough scale globally to really make the changes that you are so excited about percentage wise? It just, it just sounds like it's, it's mostly wishful thinking. He might not be wrong, right? He might not be wrong about changing the genetics of microbes or cow digestion or how rice produces itself or whatever. He might not be wrong about that. What's the feasibility of it actually taking root, no pun intended, but I'll take it, uh, to the point where it has the effect that he wants? So the only problem is that putting carbon back in soil is actually really hard. On the one hand, you've got plants and microbes that use photosynthesis to remove 120 gigatons of carbon a year from the atmosphere. But almost all of that carbon gets released right back out into the atmosphere through natural biodegradation. <laughs> I was right. I was right. Oh, man. You take like one environmental science class in college 20 years ago, and all of a sudden it's like, hey, I remembered something useful. Yeah, you're right. You could make plants, I suppose, that absorb more carbon dioxide over time. It's just being banked for release later. It's not being eliminated. So what was the point? Or how, how are you going to address that part? Processes. It's yeah. called the carbon cycle, and it's how Earth has um, you know, sustained life for billions of years. Uh-huh. And so having plants that absorb more carbon dioxide doesn't actually remove carbon dioxide from the environment. Are you going to address that problem or are you just making a concession that your plan has a fatal flaw? But human emissions have unbalanced this cycle. But that's that way. Oh, okay. Human. Oh, oh, human emissions. Uh oh, now we're getting into humans. So we're turning to giant uh, carbon dioxide removal machines that kind of try to suck carbon out of the, out of the atmosphere. <laughs> Okay, I've watched way too many Thunderfoot videos on companies claiming that they can suck carbon dioxide and carbon out of the atmosphere and turn it into plastic or something else. I've seen way too many of these videos to know that that, that endeavor is a futile one. It's just the amount of energy necessary to suck carbon dioxide and carbon out of the air it, 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 it's, it's, not, it's not feasible. It, it's not a feasible process. But they're pretty energy intensive and they're difficult to scale quickly. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so, I, I mean, I, I at least appreciate his honesty, right? He's not, he, well, so far, he's kind of hand-waving, but he's not covering up the fact that simply having a plant that absorbs more carbon dioxide does not eliminate carbon dioxide. Simply having a machine that can capture CO2 does not mean it makes sense or is particularly feasible to use it on a mass scale to capture and try to eliminate or something CO2. I appreciate that he's at least not letting that stuff get away. But then since he's not, why is he pitching these things as solutions when they're demonstrably not solutions? Whereas plants and microbes, we think, are part of the solution to put it back in soil, put carbon back in soil. It just ends up in the atmosphere. It's, it's a gas. Eventually, it's going to end up in the atmosphere. You just said it yourself. They're already, agriculture's already scaled across the globe, and it's rejuvenated every year, making change possible very quickly. Uh, okay. So our plan is to enhance photosynthesis, to capture more carbon, to be able to edit crops, to be able to create roots that grow deeper and more dense, to push carbon into the soil, and then ultimately work with that soil microbiome to be able to keep that carbon and, stay, and have it stay put in the, in the soil. But the soil has got to be... If you're talking about crops, that soil will in inevitably be churned up, being tilled for planting. So the gases will be re-released into the atmosphere either through human intervention or just natural processes. It's, it's not going away. It's not being eliminated. Is it, am I missing something? Am I, am I missing something? Now, even with all that carbon that photosynthesis absorbs every year, it's actually a pretty inefficient process. The, the, why, are, and why are you suggesting it? If it's inefficient, if it's not going to be effective, then... 
Okay, again, I at least appreciate the honesty. He's not completely sugarcoating it. He's just chlorophyll coating it. But IGI thinks we think uh, IGI scientists think we can edit those crops to improve both the way plants absorb light energy and the way that they build biomass to help improve the efficiency of photosynthesis by up to 30%. That's more carbon for food and more carbon uh, to store. You think you can. You think you can. Okay. Now, some of that extra carbon we want to put into plant roots. And there's already, an, uh, uh, to be able to edit them to be deeper and more dense. Well, I both try to be deeper and more dense at the same time. It's a nice balance. We have a, a member of an IGI member at UC Davis that's- UC Davis? Hey, we just talked about UC Davis the other day with the AMA and everything. Yeah, UC Davis. Woo, all the good stuff comes out of UC Davis, I think. Also, Jeanette E. Hellis is in the chat. Hello, Jeanette. An IGI member at UC Davis that's already identified genes that cause roots to grow deeper in rice, as shown here. Um, and deeper carbon usually stays put uh, in, in, in soil longer. D wait, deeper carbon usually stays put in soil longer. How often is usually? Now, I've talked to you about photosynthesis, how it can absorb carbon from the atmosphere. How yeah. How we're going to use roots to get the carbon into soil. Uh, usually. But if we don't work with the soil microorganisms, that carbon's just going to go right back into the atmosphere. Okay, so now we're going to genetically alter the microorganisms in soil, as in the land mass of the planet. Or, or are you just talking about specific, like, isolated farmland, like this particular, you know, square of land or something? So we're so. going to use CRISPR to try to direct the flow of that biological carbon into uh -huh. stable, long-term forms of organic and mineral complexes in soil. Wow. And IGI members already identified a lot of these stable forms of carbon. Uh -huh. So now all we have to do is edit crops and microbes to be able to try to channel that carbon into those pathways. It's, it's still carbon at the end of the day. It's still... Is, is, is it just me or does every time, he, he talk, every, every time he's talked about this concept, I keep thinking about, you know, moving deck chairs on the Titanic, right? Or, or sweeping it under the rug or something. Or just rearranging the furniture in the room to make it look like it's cleaner than it actually is. The carbon is still there. It hasn't been eliminated. You're just moving it from one place to another and I, I guess at best del delaying the inevitable or if I miss something. Uh, thank you, Kiefer Dam. Did he contradict? I don't know. Perhaps he did. I I guess I, I need an argument for that because my brain is all over the place right now trying to take it all in and process it. So uh, yeah, if I don't if I don't spot something that equates to a bingo square right off the bat, please bear with me. We'll review the uh, the card in just a few minutes. He's only got uh, he's literally got three minutes left of this. Now, now all of this work leverages the IGI public impact team. It's okay. a team dedicated to ensuring safe, ethical, and affordable solutions to climate. The public impact team pit. I, I, I might have gone with a different arrangement, but okay. Now, that team operates with full transparency. They work right side by side with our scientists. Great. And they also talk with farmers and regulators, like places uh -huh. like EPA and USDA. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and they also work closely with a global nonprofit that supplies seeds to farmers in low and middle income countries. Oh, is that going to be your delivery mechanism? Are you going to genetically modify the seeds that the nonprofit then gives off to farmers in other countries? Are, are they going to be informed that the seeds they're being provided are are genetically engineered to alter the microorganisms and cows and rice and all this other stuff? Now, most CRISPR edited crops aren't considered GMOs by the world by most of the regulators around the world.
But most. <laughs> All right. All right. So you're going to use CRISPR to revise the genetics of plants, but these don't count as genetically modified organisms. Uh, now, just just hold me back here for a second. I, you know, I, maybe, maybe I'm wrong about something, but if I modify the genetic structure of an organism, uh, that would make it a genetically modified organism, wouldn't it? So if it's not considered that by regulators, isn't that called lying? <laughs> so we truly believe there's a way to be able to scale these technologies to have a global impact. Well, 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 wait, let's just, let's just back up a little bit. I, I just want to hear that one more time. One more time. That, that supplies seeds to farmers in low and middle income countries. Now, most CRISPR edited crops aren't considered GMOs by, the world, by most of the regulators around the world. So we truly believe there's a way to be able to scale these technologies to have a global impact. Okay, so just by implication, there are regulators around the world, some of whom do not want genetically modified organisms in their countries. Conveniently, these genetically modified organisms through CRISPR somehow do not get counted as such. So does that mean, like I just suggested, you could, without having to mark your products as GMOs, uh, shepherd these seeds through your nonprofit connections to farmers in other countries without their knowledge and or consent to accepting what are literally genetically modified organisms into their environment. Is, is, is that what I took from that? that? That's what I took from that. That's interesting. I find that very interesting. So you can see why I'm excited to be here at Berkeley and, and at IGI. Uh, I, I, I don't know why you're excited. I know that you are excited. You seem to be saying one thing and then giving an exception that completely defeats the purpose of the thing that you just said again and again, but okay. You moved from DARPA to IGI. I suppose you need to be a cheerleader. It's helping me realize my vision of where global climate emission goals are met by changing the way that we grow food. Your vision your vision? Oh, this is all about you. Because I, I thought that this was for the world. Oh, all right. So is, is your title at IGI resident tyrant? <laughs> and it comes along with so many co-benefits. Oh. We don't just reduce emissions and reduce yeah. the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, you're right. You don't. <laughs> You don't reduce emissions and you don't reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. It's true. You, that's a very true statement. We improve food security. Oh, we make you? more fertile soils. We oh. Hopefully we'll do less deforestation. Oh, yeah. And the most important part is that yeah. we'll empower farmers in low and middle income countries with uh -huh. accessible and affordable techno technological solutions. Hey, I got a question for you. Uh, these microorganisms that, um, you know, uh, help or are part of, say, a cow's digestion. Let's just talk about that for a second. Are those same microorganisms or cousins thereof present in, say, oh, human digestive systems? If I happen to eat cow that has been genetically modified to change or eliminate those microorganisms in their digestive system, is that going to carry over in any particular way to me? If I eat a plant that's been genetically modified to change microorganisms, what effect is that going to have on me? Any? None at all? Zero risk? I, I don't know. I'm just, just, just wondering, you know, because it's a circle of life. Everything's connected. This is the world that I want to live in. I, I know it's, yeah, you seem to be at the center of this entire thing. I, I'm getting that. It's the world I want my children to live in.
I don't care what you want. <laughs> and it's not only possible, it's probable. Mm. Everything I've talked about today is based on real science. Mm. Real science. Yeah, real, real science. Hey, you know, uh, technically, phrenology was real science. It wasn't correct, but it was, you know, a scientific endeavor. Real science. That's happening either at the IGI or other labs around the world. Uh-huh. So with this, I'll leave you with one word. Hope. Okay. <laughs> hope. Thanks, Obama. It's easy to lose hope when it comes to climate change. Trust me. I've been one of those that's fallen victim to that. <laughs> I can imagine. But together, we can make a difference. Oh, yeah. And scientific innovation can make yeah. a difference. Okay. And together, we can help yeah. build a more sustainable future. For myself and my family, because it's my vision and what I want to see happen. Oh. So thank you so much. All right. There you go. That was a CRISPR for climate. Now, thank you, Chicago Mike. I was blinded by that. She blinded me with science. Do, 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 do. Thank you, Chicago Mike. Uh, all right. Well, um, I, I had been wondering how would it be used? How would genetic editing be used to affect the climate? That was the pitch. And with every pitch, there was a major exception or contradiction of some kind or another, which, you know, goes to Kiever Dam's uh, chat earlier. But let's move on to the bingo card. I'm going to go over it one more time by myself. And then if you guys have any ar arguments for squares to be circled, hold on to them. We'll get to you momentarily. Uh, let's see. Oh, before I get to that, though, one second. Oh, come on. Come on, StreamYard. You can do it. John Miller, again, thank you so much. I think snake oil salesmen are more, are more honest. <sighs> like I say, he at least conceded to the downsides and the exceptions in a lot of cases, but he did it in an almost like obligationary way if that's even a word i don't know if it's a word i just made it a word like he just he had to like he couldn't get past the fact that simply loading up a plant with more carbon absorbed from the environment wouldn't make the carbon go away it would just bank it until it eventually degraded that kind of thing all right well anyway bingo card let me update it here real quick save that refresh that there we go this is the bingo card so far so let's move on collectivize his own demographic uh, mm, I, I think it'd be too easy to say like human beings or something. That's not quite. So I don't think he ever really did. Uh, systemic institutional. Um, yes, the, uh, I mean, at least by implication, uh, agricultural, uh, systems, uh, and of course, you know, the, the system of life on the planet and the, you know, uh, uh, photosynthesis is a system. I don't know. I'm, I'm stretching a little bit. Childhood or family anecdote. Uh, you, he didn't really give us an anecdote. He did say, this is the world I want for my children. I don't, I might be a little strict here and say that doesn't count as an anecdote. So no. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Eh, no. Plays victim. Mm. I mean, at the end, he was like, I'm one of the ones that worries about this a lot. Yeah, I'll, I'll circle that one. I think I think that's a little bit, a little, little hyperbolic. Uh, microaggressions or unconscious bias? No, not in that sense. Privilege? No. Contradicts own point or argument? Uh, yeah. Uh, the absorption of carbon does not make it go away. Uh, you know, carbon extractors don't actually work. This process is inefficient. And on and on and on. Patriarchy, no. Weightless example. Uh, was there a weightless example in there? I'm, I'm blanking now. I know he brought up a bunch of like science did this kind of thing at the beginning. Yeah. Well, actually, you know what? Robotics. Right? The, the prosthetics and the robot hand and all that. It's got nothing to do with a genetic engineering. It's a completely different... Uh, discipline. Yeah. I don't know. Makes sense to me. Wage gap. 
Um, he talked about developing countries, didn't he? Yeah, I'll I'll circle that one, sort of in a in a abstract sense, I suppose. Feminism, no. White supremacy, no. Word salad. Uh. <sighs> I don't know that there was word salad in there. There was a whole bunch of contradictory crossover stuff, but I mean, I understood what he was saying. There, there wasn't, there wasn't a point where I felt he was just saying words for the sake of saying words. Uh, self vilification or wretchedness. No, I don't think so. Argumentative non sequitur. I know I was laughing at something <laughs> at one point that seemed a bit off kill. I, I might need a reminder on that one. I'm, I'm already overwhelmed. Uh, attempt to coin new buzzword or buzz phrase. I didn't hear anything new out of there. Uh, mind reading assumes motives. Uh, well, yeah, his vision, what he wants, the world that he sees it and so on, assuming that however he sees it is what everybody else wants. It's one way to look at benevolent condescension. Yeah. Did you know that science can change the world? I love that part. Did you know that science can have an, uh, an extreme effect on society and the world? Yeah, thanks. Anecdote that probably never happened. He didn't really give any anecdotes. Uh, you know, examples that he put out there of scientific achievements or discoveries or advancements or whatever, those happened. So, And leaves out vital context. Uh, I mean, I, I guess, I guess the one question that kept coming up in my mind is how exactly you're going to distribute any of this on such a wide enough scale that it's going to have a meaningful effect. And he never got to that. He, he hinted obviously at the whole seed distribution thing that aren't technically GMOs. I like that part. I like how that was very subtle. You had to listen for a second there to figure, to kind of piece that potential together. But, uh, but yeah. Anyway, there's the card as I have it. I don't know if we can get a bingo out of this, but I'm certainly open to arguments for squares to be circled. So if you have those, please put them in the chat now. If I've already missed something you put uh, previously, just repost it. Advocas Diabli, uh, let's see, vital context missing. What happens when these new plants are ingested by animals that have not evolved to process these newly formulated compounds created by these new plants? Well, that's the other thing too. It's like, well, we're going to, uh, you know, change cow in order to, you know, uh, do, do away with these microorganisms. And we're going to change these plants to do so because only cows will eat these plants. There's, there's no risk that any of these modified things will get out into the uh, rest of the world and potentially affect other uh, species or anything else. I mean, how, how do you know it's not going to cause more problems? Yeah. Uh, but yes, leaves out vital context. That that also counts. That's a good one as well. Uh, let's see. Guy in his room, a non sequitur. Him saying this wouldn't work either, I think, after some process explanation. Um, well, now, our argument of non sequitur, it's got to be something that comes up that has no connection to anything else, as though he's making a point. That's 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 the tricky thing about the argumentative non sequitur. It's like he has to like highlight something as though it were meaningful, but actually isn't attached to anything or doesn't further his argument in any particular way whatsoever. So uh, him giving an example, but also admitting to a, a downside to it, that's not a, that's not a non sequitur. That is relevant. That is attached. So I don't. I don't think, unless unless I'm misunderstanding, and if I am, just give me another give me another swing at that. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Uh, Roan wouldn't be surprised if he actually creates the Umbrella Corporation. Yeah, I know. It's like oh, we're gonna we're gonna genetically modify some stuff in a lab and then just kind of like secretly release it into the environment through a nonprofit that distributes seeds everywhere that we don't have to mark as GMOs. That's probably the most insidious part of this presentation of what was said, but not said at the same time and the implications thereof. It's like, let me put these things together. We're partnering with this uh, uh, nonprofit that distributes seeds across the globe. Also, did you know that none of these things actually count as GMOs? <laughs> Twiddle thumbs, look around. Doo -doo -doo. Yeah. Something about that. 
Something about that. Roasted opinions, at best, the animals can't digest them properly. At worst, the effects are immediately toxic. I, I, I guess we'll find out because IGI is on the march towards his vision of the future. <laughs> How comforting. Uh, Roger Reynolds, uh, yeah, when you are constantly getting beaten over the head with it, you either lose hope or call out their BS. Uh, yeah, I mean, it depends on what we're talking about. Uh, fear mongering, fear mongering, fear mongering. And I have, I have, I, I kind of come at this from two different directions. On the one hand, uh, I don't think it helps anything to get all freaked out. It just, it just doesn't. It causes more uh, problems than it probably solves. And secondly, as far as I understand it, the damage is done. You know, uh, the countries that are producing the most uh, carbon emissions, the countries that are burning the most fossil fuels, they're not stopping and they're not going to stop. They have no reason to stop. Their economies, their lifestyles, uh, their GDP depends on it. So that's not going to stop. Uh, whatever's been released into the atmosphere is already released into the atmosphere. Uh, whatever is going to happen the damage has already been done. So I, in, in my mind, it, it is kind of a fatalistic viewpoint. Uh, at the same time, when I remember growing up, I was told left, right, and center that if we didn't change our ways in 30 years, then acid rain would be melting our brains out by now. And I, I mean, maybe it has. Um, maybe they were warning me of something more abstract. Maybe, maybe TEDx talks are acid rain. I, I don't know. But... Uh, Anyway, Advocast Diablo, the entire spiel about DARPA was non sequitur, seeing as how he said they gave no shits about climate change. Well, he was talking about his personal story and how he came from one place to another. And he was talking about being involved in different aspects of scientific advancement. So I'm not sure it was non sequitur in that sense. Uh, he, he was talking about his motivations and his history. So I, I don't think it's a non. Uh, I mean, I'll say his life story doesn't really contribute to the argument that we should be editing genes to to help the climate. So maybe in that sense, but he was talking about his motivations for coming over and starting this. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, if somebody can pick up that notion and make it a better argument, because I'm not sure, I because it's hard for me to say that him explaining how he arrived at his job and what he does and how that then leads into uh, his work towards this end, that may be relevant for the sake of just the story. I don't know if it counts as a non sequitur. Hmm. Grand Inquisitor Tiago, do you want Nexus from Fern Gully? Because this is how you get Nexus from Fern Gully. Oh man. Oh man, Tim Curry. Oh, Tim Curry. Great villain voice. Great villain voice. All right. Uh, I've not seen too many more arguments. If you have any other arguments for squares to be circled, put them on the chat now. If you have any refinements of previous articles as well, please put them up there. Uh, let's see. Programming note. Earlier this week, if you didn't already see it, I did a two-part special looking at a panel discussion from the American Medical Association the Center for Health Equity, uh, discussing the fallout, ramifications, and possible solutions after the Supreme Court's decision on affirmative action. It went swimmingly, as you can probably imagine. If you haven't already watched it, it's there. And it's ad-free. So there you go. Uh, also, this coming Sunday, 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 at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern, will be the Sunday stream, where I'll talk about a thing. Not quite sure yet what it'll be. I'll probably decide on Saturday. And later that same Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, will be the next installment of the series I'm doing with my friend Leonora, Book Review of the Vampire. We'll be taking a look at the next section of the Vampire Lestat. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, that'll be happening later on. And in the background, I should give some kind of update here. Uh, I have been trying very, very hard to line up 
the next interview with a true crime content creator for a series that I'm very excited to continue, but circumstances keep throwing wrenches into all the plans. Uh, part of it is that a lot of true crime content creators right now are gearing up for crime con, which is taking place uh, in and around the end of September. And that's throwing people's schedules all in a tizzy because they're working to get videos created so they can have those scheduled ahead of time to have those go live when CrimeCon happens. And so everybody's busy scripting and editing and God knows what else. Uh, or just random life things come about that throw a wrench into the plan. So it's not for lack of trying. Let me tell you that. It's not for lack of trying. But uh, uh, crime, true crime content creators are an elusive uh, bunch. I'm trying to capture them. I will try. Uh, let's see. John Miller, if he wants to talk about ethics, maybe get into just because he can modify genes. Should we? Yes, the Ian Malcolm argument from Jurassic Park. Just because you can, should you? And uh, let's see. Yep, I think I'll call that here, everybody. So yeah, no bingos. I didn't expect really any because this is kind of an off the uh off the ranch no pun intended but i'll take it uh talk from usual it just seemed like a very interesting title and it caused in me a whole bunch of questions to be asked and i have a whole bunch of questions still and a whole bunch of suspicions as well now <laughs> but either way i appreciate you guys joining me for it i hope you learned something or had something affirmed for yourself either way let me know down in the comments what you thought about it if i didn't get your comment on here also if you would on the way out leave a like I'm still trying to get to uh, 100 likes on a stream just, just for the heck of it. I don't think it's happened yet since I started doing that, which was like the last show or whatever. But if you happen to like the show, please hit the like button. If you didn't, you can hit the dislike button. I, I appreciate the engagement either way. Uh, let's see, anything else? I think that's the big stuff. So uh, everyone, thank you for joining me. Moderators, thank you for keeping an eye on things. Even though everyone here is so well behaved, you have very, very little to do. Everybody who donated either to myself or to the fundraisers at the top of the chat box. Thank you guys so much for your generosity. I really do appreciate it. Uh, hope everybody has a good rest of the Thursday and a good Friday ahead of you. If you have Monday off for the uh, Labor Day weekend, I hope you enjoy your Labor Day weekend and you have a safe and fun time with your family or just sitting at home lazing about as probably I will. And as well, I hope you're all safe and well. And if you're not well, please get well soon. And I'll see you guys next time. Take care. Bye-bye.